Welcome everyone. I just want to take a moment to see your faces and your names. Thanks for spending your lunch together. There's so much that I want to share with you. I do have some slides that I'll be going over, but I'd love it if you posted in the chat, you know, where you're tuning in from and what your business is. As I go through the four secrets to manifesting clients, you're welcome to post questions in the chat. Depending on time, I may stop to answer it. And if I don't do it while I'm presenting, I promise to loop back around and answer your questions. So I'll go ahead and share my screen with you. And if you can give me the thumbs up that you can see my screen. Okay, awesome. So welcome to our topic. It's called the four secrets to manifesting clients. If you're meeting me for the first time, my name's Khadija Yansani. I'm here in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, born and raised. I'm in Vallejo for those of you that are familiar with the Bay Area. Um, I'm the founder of bloomin2.com. That's my website. And my signature program is the Business Queen Academy, where I work with coaches, healers, guides, experts to create, launch, and market their signature offer. And even if you're a product-based business, you're going to get a lot of value from this. Um, but in, inside of my practice, I'm just sharing with you who I work with. I have also worked as an executive coach with dozens of Fortune 500 companies as a communications coach like Visa, Charles Schwab, Clorox, and Robert Half. In my private practice, I've helped my clients to get their first clients, their next clients, have their you know first 10K month, which is something that many people in my world are really excited about and are striving for. I have facilitated hundreds of workshops, events online, offline, in the areas of personal growth and development. And I'm thrilled to be here collaborating with the San Francisco Library. Many of the people that I work with love to teach, love to share their knowledge. I'm also a mom of two of, I have an eight and six year old together with my husband, Mike, and I really understand what it means to be juggling so many responsibilities. Some of my clients have full-time jobs and they're building their business on the side. Some of my clients are dealing, you know, I myself have aging parents, you have children, you have pets, and this idea that we can only create our business when we just have all the time that we need to work on our book or work on our projects is not true. That however much time you have is how much time you have, and I'll be showing you today how you can maximize your time. If I could get to my next slide. All right, so today we are going to cover how to master your mindset, how to magnetize your manifesting. I call them the four M's of client creation, how to maximize your marketing, and how to monetize your magic, which is you know your skills, your expertise, your gifts. So secret number one is that you really want to master your mindset. And if this isn't something that happens once, just like we don't work out once, we don't do yoga once, we don't do any of the practices that we, we don't clean our house once, we don't brush our teeth once. It's an ongoing thing. And I love this quote by Napoleon Hill that says, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And so I'll say it one more time, whatever your mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And so your mind had this vision for a business or for your next project. And so if you can see it, there might not, there might be some skills that you need to learn. Um, just know that it's possible. So I want to talk about a little bit about why is mastering our mindset so important? I think that being an entrepreneur, growing your business is a unique experience that most people do not have. And so once you begin to put yourself out there, you're faced with a whole host of insecurities, doubts. Are people going to buy this? Is this good enough? So I'm going to share with you a list in a little bit. But if we don't master our mindset, then it's it's very easy to argue for your limitations. With all the work that I've done on myself and continue to do myself, I still <laughs> have to face my own limitations and be like, okay, that's just a story I'm telling myself. If you don't master your mindset, 
it's really easy to get frozen and fall into procrastination and find it really hard to take action because there's just something there that's not letting you take the next step. It'll be difficult to start a project. And if you do start a project, it might be really hard to finish. You won't be in action, right? So one of the things that you probably have heard is that like the way that we think impacts the actions that we take. It impacts how we feel. How we feel impacts the actions we take and the actions we take impact our result. And so if we're not careful about what we're thinking and our mindset, then it's gonna stop us from taking action. It'll also put you in a place where you're at the whim of everything that's happening around you. Let's say you put something out there and you don't get the result that you want, or maybe a client isn't getting the result that they want, or they want a refund. And then it's very easy to not feel solid and easily be knocked around. You can also find yourself just spinning and trapped in the monkey mind of what ifs and all the possibilities that could go wrong. What if this happens? What if people don't like it? Um, all these what ifs. And usually when we're saying the what ifs, it's not something positive. So I would love for you to type a one in the comments if you can relate to anything that I am sharing and will be sharing. And the main idea here is that if you don't conquer your fear, your doubt, and your insecurity is going to lead the show. And I want to remind you that we always have a choice. And it's like, is that thought helping me? Is that moving me closer to my vision or mission? Or is it having me stay small and stay safe? I want to share a list of some reasons why people don't get clients not of them, not all of them may be applicable to you, but it can be really helpful when you see the list. And I just want you to either silently in your mind acknowledge them, or you know, you're welcome to type a one in the comments. I'm going to look at the chat really quickly. Awesome. Okay, I'll come back. <laughs> so one is, you know, not being visible enough. Visibility is a big thing that um, comes up a lot in my community and my work with clients. And like everything, it's a practice. And so if people only hear about your offer once or what you're offering, then it's easy to forget about it. Um, there's sometimes can be an unwillingness to be vulnerable. Maybe that's an unwillingness to ask for help or share what you've gone through or even, you know, that vulnerability could just be sharing the success that one of your clients has had. I have found sometimes it's so hard for people to just say, I helped this person lose this amount of weight or find the love of their life. They feel like it's not humble to say it. Sometimes it's procrastination, not taking action for a really, really long time for a whole host of reasons. Um, Maybe thinking the thought that if I if I have to work so hard to do it, maybe it's not right. Um, I work with, I know there are men and women and on this call, and a lot of my clients sometimes fall into the trap of thinking, you know, you probably hear this or have heard this online of like doing business the feminine way. And sometimes people feel like that means not having to take any action. And when in fact we need both, right? Like we need structures and systems and we also need to be able to follow our passion. We need to have that balance of rest and activity. I think that's very important. Sometimes it's not getting the right support. I've heard people say things like, I know what I need to do, but I just need to do it. So I'll just go through this list. A lot of people that I work with tend to be heart-centered, soulful people and love the personal development work. So type a one in the comments if you love personal development and spiritual growth. And, some, and that's a beautiful thing. And then sometimes people can feel like, okay, I, I have to heal. I have to work on my confidence first before taking the action. Sometimes it's just not willing to invest to learn the skills that you need to learn. Maybe you need to learn how to market. Maybe you need to learn how to craft your offer. Um, sometimes there's just, if you don't know how to do something, I was talking to someone yesterday. It's like, they were sharing with me how they didn't know that they needed to make an offer. 
And I was like, well, how would you know if like, if this is not your business, how would you know how to do it unless someone taught you how to do it? Then there's the the niggly, you know, limiting thoughts like, oh, the economy is happening right now. I don't think anyone's buying this or I'll wait and see what happens with something else. I'll wait until after the holidays. Like there's always going to be a better time. What if no one signs up for my program? What if it's not good enough? I see so many out there offering something similar to me. How am I going to stand out? And it doesn't mean that none of these things are considerations, but if we pay too much attention on them, it could take us away from taking action. Sometimes it's just not having a clear offer and package for people to buy. You know, sometimes people are, they are being visible on social, they're creating content, but there's no call to action, which is having someone, inviting someone into the next step with you. If your niche is not clear and people aren't quite sure how you can help them, then it's going to be hard for them to want to take the next step and invest to work with you. So this is a big one, not making offers. That is really critical. We have to make offers. Offers are how you make sales. Offers are how you make invitations. Sometimes I share this story. I'm on Instagram and a woman I know, she sells jewelry. And I noticed her necklace in a story and I just, you know, messaged her and say, oh, I like the necklace. I don't think that I was thinking I wanted to buy it, but I noticed it enough to just compliment her on the necklace. And then she said to me, it would look great on you. Do you want to buy it? So she had an offer. Do you want to buy the necklace? If she didn't say that, maybe I wouldn't have purchased it. And so sometimes there's that gap where you're just not even letting people know that they can actually purchase it. Not having a proven system that works. So if you're not knowing what you're doing every month or week to get clients, then it could just feel like you're just trying things and nothing's working. And so you want to know that this is the framework that I'm using to attract clients on a monthly, weekly basis. Not establishing themselves as enough of an expert in their area of expertise. And so that's really critical. And, you know, we'll be talking more about that in a few sections, but you want to be known for the thing that you do. You want your, your profiles everywhere you show up to support what it is that you say that you do, whether it's through testimonials, um, case studies, and you talking about that very thing on a regular basis. Not having a community around the problem that you solve, that's so valuable to have your own community and they're looking to you to support them with this issue. So if you don't yet have a community, that could be an email community, a social media community, um, on Facebook, a live community through a meetup, you want to have your own community of people that you can connect with and invite to take the next step with if it feels aligned for them. We kind of mentioned, you know, not having a plan or strategy. So the point is, if you don't have a plan or strategy to get clients, it's going to be hard to bring clients in. This is a tricky one because many entrepreneurs are multi-passionate and it's easy to get caught up in the next shiny object. Like, oh, this week I'm doing a Facebook group strategy. And then you do it and you're like, oh, that's too much work. I don't want to do this. Then next week you're like, I'm going to do a podcast. And then you're like, oh, not many people listen to the first episode. Okay, now I'm going to try this other strategy. So it's really important that you give strategies enough time to see how they're working and operating. Again, arguing for your own limitations and convincing yourself or others around you like why you can't do it. I hope you guys are getting some, you know, some ahas here. Even though I created this list because I've heard them, I can still fall into these things too. And I have to remind myself, okay, like that's not helpful. Um, let me get back to what it is that I want and what's the strategy to get there. 
focusing a lot of time on non-income producing activities like tweaking websites, getting business cards made, handing out business cards, and hoping people will want to magically work with you. I'm not saying that these having these collateral materials are not important, but sometimes people get fall into the rabbit hole. Like I've seen people like it's taken them a year to set up a beautiful website, but it still not lead to actually getting paying clients. And so you really wanna ask yourself, look at your activities, audit your activities, and see if the activity that you're doing, is that actually gonna lead to a call, lead to, to new business versus just overwhelming yourself with a lot of activity, but it not growing your business. This was a big one for me. It's just like waiting for someone to tell you that you're good enough to validate your business idea that part of it is as you put yourself out there, like it's really important to believe in yourself. And as you put yourself out there, you're going to grow your confidence. You're going to grow your belief in yourself, but it doesn't happen beforehand. So again, waiting until they're confident enough. I think that confidence happens as you step outside of your comfort zone and you learn and you keep increasing your capacity. Similarly, you know, waiting to overcome all the fears and doubts about whether your business can actually help people or not. Like there's a part of you that wouldn't even start or be choose looking to grow if you didn't know deep down that you could help people. And so again, it's like this whole thing of waiting, pausing, waiting, waiting for the right time, the right place, waiting to be the right person before taking the next step. So those are some things that you want to be mindful of that can sabotage your efforts. And one of the things that can help you is to make sure that you have a tool to tame your mind. Otherwise, your mind is going to tame you. My mind can tame me if I'm not diligent and deliberate about it. And so what you want to focus on instead is all the reasons why you're uniquely qualified to help your ideal clients. Even if tons of people are doing the same thing, why are you uniquely qualified? Because you're different. There's a different way that you do it. You want to have tools to deal with your negative thoughts. You know, I listed a few here. It's fine if none of them resonate with you, but you want to ask yourself if they don't, what tools am I going to put in place when the fear voice arises and tells me I'm not good enough, my product or service isn't good enough, that it costs too much, that no one's going to buy? Because if we're stuck here, it's really hard to move forward and take action and to share our services with the enthusiasm needed um, for people to want to take the next step. Another way to manage your mindset is to learn and work from people who are further along than you. Um, Kirsty just mentioned all the services that the San Francisco Public Library offers that can support you if you resonate with me, if there's another coach that you resonate with, but you're not meant to do it alone. It's, it's more confidence boosting and it feels very clarifying to have a strategy and know that you have direction to achieve your goals. So that was secret number one. Secret number two is around manifesting, right? And so what I quickly want to say about this, you know, this is a really fun conversation. I feel like a lot of people love talking about this topic, myself included, but to demystify it, Manifesting simply means making our creative dreams real. You know, so you have a vision for a product, you have a vision for a service, you have a vision to host a retreat, and it stays kind of here in your mind, floating around until we create a plan of action for it to put it out into the world where it becomes a tangible product or service that the market can engage with. I love this quote by Esther Hicks that says, the law of attraction is most understood when you see yourself as a magnet getting more and more of the way you feel. It's more and more of the way that you feel. And so when we think about some of the mindset things we just talked about, if we're telling ourselves all these reasons why we're not good enough and can't, 
that feeling is insecurity. That feeling is self-doubt. That feeling of not good enough. That's what we're magnifying. Whereas if we're focusing on why we're uniquely qualified, why we love our service, um, how other people that we've worked with have, have benefited, then we're like bringing that enthusiasm to our conversations, to our videos, to all of it. A thing that can help you expand that feeling is getting clear on your why. Like, why are you starting this business? And if you've already started your business, like sometimes we need to re-remember re like, oh yeah, I got in this business for this. So maybe it could be your business. It could be your why for a particular program or product that you're currently selling. Why is that important to you? How do you think it's going to help others? What will be the impact if people engage with you and do the work and feeling excited about that. We need to have, it needs to be compelling because if it's not compelling and our clients need this too, like if they don't have a compelling reason to lose the weight, they're just not gonna lose the weight. <laughs> if they don't have a compelling reason to save money, like I wanna send my kid to college or I want to, you know, travel the world without that compelling reason, it could hard, it can be hard for it to be a sustainable thing that you commit to. So think about like, why, why am I creating this next offer? Why am I starting? Why do I want to take the next step in my business? What's my vision? Feeling, feeling those feelings around it. You really want to ask yourself, is this a hobby or your business? The reason this is important is that a lot of entrepreneurs are multi-passionate and are good at many things. And you don't have to monetize every single thing that you're good at. I have so many trainings and certifications. Type a one in the comments if you've done a lot of trainings, workshops, you have multiple things that you could offer. And not, you know, you might not want to monetize every single one of those things. I often share the story of how like I was trained as a doula in my 20s. I was really passionate about birth work and I attended several births. And then later on, I realized that, you know, I realized that I didn't want to, it to be my business. It helped me have, you know, empowering birth experiences and I had my daughter at home, but I, I had to tell myself, you know what? I love this, but I don't want to earn money doing it. And ironically, I've worked with lots of birth work workers, or I have worked with lots of birth workers in my business. So you want to ask yourself, thanks, I see the comments in the chat. Is this a business or a hobby? Because if it's a hobby, then give yourself permission to just be like, oh, I don't want to market this. I don't want to sell this. I want to pick it up when I want to. If it, you've decided that it is your business, it's important that you have a new relationship with sales and marketing. And so I think that this, just answering this question is gonna save you lots of time and energy because like I, I gave you the doula example, it was, I was like, I'm supposed to do it, but I didn't want to. <laughs> and so ask yourself, is this a business or a hobby? Hobbies are great. There's nothing wrong with hobbies. They make life enriching and fun and meaningful, and you can pick it up when you want. Whereas if you're going to treat something like a business, there's a certain level of commitment that you're going to show up with on a consistent basis. So you also want to like rate your commitment to your business on a scale of one to 10, like one being I'm not that committed. So like with a hobby, we can love it, but we can say, you know what? I I think I'm going to take a break from ski season. I'll pick it up next year. Um, and 10 being, I'm committed to this. And we can always get back on the horse and renew our commitment to our, our business activities. Another way to magnify our manifestation is we want to set clear and positive intentions. And once you know your why, then you're going to like set our goals, which is what we're going to do now. So I want to share with you four steps to setting a powerful intention. So number one is you want to set a goal. I know some people don't like the word goal, but pick a better word if you don't like the word goal. It could be vision, dream desire, intention. And so 
all a goal is, is, is the container with which you want to achieve something. So again, we talked about manifesting means taking our idea out from here in our head, and we want to create it into something that we can see, hold, and touch. So you want to set a goal that lights you up based on your why. You want to write it down on a piece of paper, I would say both, and or declare it out loud. So again, we're taking it out of our mind. We're putting it on paper. Now we can see it. It's not just a thought that's swimming with all of our millions of other thoughts, but now we're like focusing our attention on this desire. And you can say it out loud to yourself or to someone that you trust, who you feel like is going to support you. You don't wanna say it to someone who is, you feel like they're gonna say, oh, well, that's a stupid idea. Like, I don't think, I think you should just get a job. Like, that's just a pipe dream. That is not going to help you build the confidence you need around your goal, especially if you're not strong in it on your own. So that's step number two. And then three, I often say that this sounds like it's obvious, but you know, feel free to raise your hand. I can't see them right now, but you could put a, a one in the comments. If there are things that you want in your life right now that you're not taking action on. So quite often, you can have a desire to lose weight. You can have a desire to read more. You can have a desire to, you know, do something in your business. But if you look at your daily actions, that you're not actually taking actions toward it. And anything I say here during this presentation, I don't want that you're not allowed to use this against yourself. This is only used for awareness and information, and that we get to choose a new way that supports our desire and supports what we want. So you wanna take actions that are in alignment with what you want and eliminate those that are not in alignment. And that could be something as simple as that you're committed to all these activities that you're not really into and they're just taking up time. Um, maybe for a period of time, you need to remove certain things from your schedule so that you have more mental space and physical space to take action on your business dreams. Step number four is kind of the toughest one. Step number four is that you wanna be committed to the actions and show up like with all of your energy, but then we also have to release the outcome, which can be really tough. Have you ever worked on something and you're like, you're constantly looking at it. Has it changed? Has it increased? Has any, and it's like, we have to release attachment. I often use the example, if you've ever been in the experience, I have, where you're waiting for someone to call you and they're not calling and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting and they haven't called. Then you get tired of waiting and you say, you know what? I'm gonna go out and enjoy myself, do something, you forget about it, and then the phone rings. And so this is the same principle that we wanna apply to our business, that you do what you can and then you release attachment to the outcome. So a simple formula, to set a clear and simple intention is that, you know, it's my intention to feel, you could use a, an adjective that lights you up. It's in my intention to feel light, or it's my intention to um, get a hundred new subscribers by a particular date. And you can also say the emotion of how you intend to feel. That being said, the date isn't used as a way to like beat yourself up because you didn't achieve it by that date. But what it does is that it gives you focus, it helps anchor you and having that clarity of knowing what you're working towards, you're gonna get far further than if you don't set the goal at all. And then also be flexible. Sometimes it needs, it needs a few more weeks or a few more months. But as you continue to put your attention on anything that you're wanting to manifest in your business, it's going to reveal itself as you, as you focus on it with greater strength. All right, I, I feel like peeking in the chat very quickly. Um, 
Marianne says multiple trainings and I love them all. Yes, I can totally re, um, relate to that. I say most of the people that I work with, like we are lifelong learners. I'm a lifelong learner. And I think that there's nothing wrong with um, learning and it can be so helpful to focus our energy and then and, and follow through something to completion. So thank you for sharing that. Secret number three, how we can maximize our marketing. So the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well, the product or service fits him and sells itself. I love this quote because a lot of solopreneurs that I talk to have a fear of being too salesy, marketing too much, um, annoying people, bothering people, feeling having people feel like they're all about the money. And this quote says that the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well. And that means how can you know the customer if you don't care about them? So you, you want to know who your audience is and that what you're offering them fits them so well. So I want you to think about your marketing, that there's a language that your ideal client thinks, talks, and feels about their problems and dreams. They're like, you, you may have heard, you may not have heard, how do they say it? How would they say it? And quite often people feel and talk in plain language. They might say things like, my back hurts or my lower back hurts or I can't get clients. I lost my job. I can't find a job. The economy is tough. My relationship sucks. My clothes don't fit. What's wrong with me? Why can't I find the partner I've been looking for? I just don't know if I can do it. I don't know how to do it. I'm just so tired. I'm really pissed off. They won't let me. It's too hard. Why does this always happen to me? I give up. There's a way that your ideal talk, your ideal client talks about their experience as it relates to what it is that you offer. And the closer, the closer you talk about it in that way, the more that they're going to feel like you really understand and get what they're going through. So there's a way that you're communicating your business to your audience, and that is your messaging. And you want to be able to say what it is you do and for whom you do it. And quite often, sometimes there's a way that as the solopreneur, you want to say it. And it might not necessarily, and it doesn't mean that you're not able to help the person, but you may be off the mark in the way that you're communicating what you do to them that has them know that you can actually move them along on their journey. And so if you're finding that you're putting a lot of stuff out and you're not getting the response that you want, you might want to take a, a fresh look at your messaging. Like, do you feel like it's if it's matching your ideal client's language? Um, I like this example a lot. You may know uh, there's a book called Calling in the One. And the goal of the book is to help people find their soulmate. And which is great messaging. <laughs> and people say, I just want to find the one. Like she's very in tune. I just want to find the one. And so if you as a solopreneur feel like, you know what, the path to finding the one is to fall in love with yourself and you instead market, fall in love with yourself. And that's, that's, that might be missing the mark for what your potential client is looking for. That being said, inside of that book, Calling in the One, she places a huge emphasis on self-love, on forgiveness, on all these other things. But what she's leading with is calling in the one. And her is the expert. She knows that part of how you get there is through self-love. Rather than pitching self-love or marketing self-love, because someone might feel like, well, I already love myself. I just want to find my soulmate. So type a yes or no in the comment, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I'm happy to um, come back around and discuss it further. 
So if you want to maximize your marketing, there's a few things that you can do to, to dial in your messaging. So, and how can you do this so that you're talking in the same language? So you, you both are speaking English, you're not speaking English and they're speaking French. You want to meet your clients where they're at. I'll just give you another little example. This can happen in relationships. Let's say one partner um, is really upset about something and they feel like they want to be listened to. And the other partner feels sad that this partner is upset. And then they just start giving them solutions. But at this particular point, this person doesn't want solutions. They just want listening. So do you see how there's like a, a clash? Like, you're not listening to me. So it can be the same thing when we're talking about messaging with our, with our potential clients. So one of the ways to do that is to do ongoing interviews. You could do surveys for your ideal clients. Um, this, can, this can take place in a formal way and an informal way. So the formal way is to actually physically pass out surveys, you know, whether it's like a, those online surveys, I've done them both, you know, handwritten surveys, but then online surveys, you could do interviews with clients or former clients and just let them know that I'm looking to improve my services or I'm, I'm creating an offer to help certain group of people do this. And I would love to get your feedback on that. And it doesn't have to be long. The big thing here is that you don't want to already assume what it is for other people. You always want to ask your ideal clients. Um, always be listening, whether that's if, you, if you're already the owner of a Facebook group, maybe you have a shop and you have customers who come in. I just filled out a survey of a program that I was in. They wanted to know how the delivery of the program was. And they dripped out the content, which I see the value in. And when I was going through it, I felt like, oh, I wish I had all the content at, what, at once because what I had was upcoming and I wanted to be able to access them sooner. And so now they have that information and they may adjust that. So we never want to assume what it is for people. Like, even if you're like, the person wants to lose weight, you don't know why they want to lose weight. You want, you want to have those answers. People don't, like, raise your hand if you don't like when people make assumptions about you. I'm raising my hand, right? And so our, our community, our potential clients don't like when we assume what they need and what they want either. We just, we want to pose it as a question. And that's why I always say a lot of people in my community are, it's because I've been talking to people in my community and I'm always listening. That doesn't mean that you have to implement everything that is said. It's like this beautiful dance between what they need and how you feel inspired to support with your services. Let me just see here in the chat. No problem, Angela. There will be um, a replay. Um, Kirsty says the library owns that book in print and ebook e format. Awesome. <laughs> so another thing here is we want to be open to the language, our, um, not be so attached to the language that we want to use, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, the way that I came up with my program, the, in its first iteration, it was called the Client Creation Program. And I came up with that because clients kept asking me, how do I get clients? How do I get clients? Can you help me get clients? And so it's like, oh, okay, there's my program. And so there's probably a way that people are already coming and asking you for something, wanting something from you. There's something that you do well take those things into consideration. And you don't wanna to be too attached to the language that you use. Sometimes our language could be ambiguous. So I'll admit my website has an ambiguous name of my business. The reason why that's okay, so my the name of my business is Bloom Into You. And so you can kind of infer what you think that means, right? But my I have another website that's called Manifest Clients Now. And so that's so clear. And so we want to have our, our titles for things, even if your business name itself has a more ambiguous name, like you want your products and service, your products and services to have very benefit driven, like people know what they're going to get when they, they purchase this. 
you want to build in your in your marketing materials their languaging the things that they're dealing with their dreams in the way that they describe it not just the way that you describe it so if they say things like you know i just can't fit in my clothes anymore and so if you're a person that is either a nutrition's coach or a stylist you can be like are you just are you just so frustrated with not being able to wear your clothes? You don't feel good in anything you wear. And then they're like, yes, how do you know? Because you were listening. Another place that you can get wind of this, how they say it is when you're doing consultations. I know maybe not all of you do consultations, but for those of you that do, whether the person signs up to work with you or not, there's gold there. I just want to be, where am I with time? Um, so you can listen to the, the their objections on sales calls. It's going to be helpful if you solve one problem for one group of people. That doesn't mean you can't help as many people as you want, but the more targeted you can be, the better. And do your best to eliminate ambiguity in your marketing. If, if ever you feel like, People might not know what, if they might have to guess or might have to ask, it might be a little bit too ambiguous. All right, secret number four is how to monetize your magic. Find out what you like doing best and get someone to pay you for it. Who wants that? Who wants to do what they'd love to do and get paid to do it? So the point of any business is to make you money. Yes. I imagine it's your passion, um, but if you're not making money at your in your business, then you risk financial instability, and there's a lot of stress that comes with that. If you find yourself saying it's not about the money, then I would say that it's important to explore your relationship to money or just accept that it's not a hobby. You're not required to charge if that's not what you want. However, if you do want to grow your business, we just have to make peace with selling, marketing, and, and charging for our services. So the lifeblood of any business that exists is to, you need clients and customers. There's like no way around it if it's your intention to grow your business. So you're like, okay, Khadija, I get it's about making money and paying clients. So how should I do this? How can I monetize? So I'm going to share with you the exact framework that I've used for myself and my clients to generate tens of thousands of dollars. So pay attention, um, take notes, and you can ask me some questions in a few. So type a one in the comments if you're ready to see the framework. Awesome. I see the chat thing increasing. <laughs> So this is my nine step to the client creation queen process framework. And so I'll go through it. Step one is you have to decide that you're going to create a new client. You're going to be visible. You're going to just do the thing that you've been thinking about. And you're going to like come with that level of fierceness of decision. Because if it's like wobbly, Again, it's not that compelling why. It's not compelling enough. So step two is you want to be clear in your niche. So you want to identify who you help, what you help them with. You want it to be clear. And if you're, if people are like, oh, that's nice, or doing like this, it might not be clear. So if you've got colleagues to ask, are you clear on what I do? Try to get that mirroring. Step three is to host a promotional event. Now, promotional event could be in person. It could be online. Like this is a, a promotional event, right? It could be a Facebook Live that you invite people to. For those of you that are like, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> That's okay. There are other ways, right? Like if you feel like stepping out on your own feels a little bit too scary, you can find other people to partner with. So like I'm partnering with Kirsty here in the San Francisco library. And the beauty of that is that you get to introduce each other to each other's audiences. So it doesn't, if it takes some pressure off of you of feeling like you have to do it yourself, then there's some workarounds. But the bottom line is that you want to position you and your services, um, position yourself as an expert and have a call to action. Step four 
if it's applicable to your business where you do a consultation, then you would do a consultation. Not every business offers a consultation. So maybe the next step would be to purchase something, which is fine. So this timeline, these nine steps, could you might use all nine or you know it might end here where you've done something and then the next thing is for them to buy your book. It's to buy a program. If not, if you need to talk to them, you would offer the consult. Step five is schedule a time. That sounds obvious, but so often people, you know, someone might DM you and just start asking you questions and you're like at your kid's school, right? And so you need to set a time where they're treating it as a professional appointment and you can be fully present. Step six is you want to deliver the consultation. And that's not so much about, um, it's finding out if you're a fit to work together and maybe what they need is outside the scope of what you do. And maybe you refer them out or maybe you lead them to some other offerings that you have that you feel like might be a, a best next step for them. If it is a fit, then you would make an offer, um, present your unique solution of how you can help them. And then step eight is to ask for the sale. So I shared with you earlier that that woman on Instagram asked me if I wanted to purchase her necklace. So she didn't miss the opportunity to say, hey, you can buy this. And so often people will do all these steps and don't invite people to work with them. If that person is a yes, there's always choice, right? We always wanna leave people better off then we found them. Sometimes people aren't ready to take the next step. Again, you can make a referral. Maybe you have another resource that you can send them to. If they are a yes, then that means you have a new client, a new client and then you would accept payment. So that is the nine-step client creation framework. Um, and so who here wants this? I know maybe some of you may have screenshotted, but I would love to offer you this for free. And um, you can also download the ultimate guide to client creation where it's going to go a little bit deeper than what we covered here. And it's a, it, it's a great guide that goes deeper into the four M's that we talked about today, which were mindset, manifesting, marketing, and monetization. So I will put that in the chat and then I would love to stop sharing so I can come here and look at this chat. Awesome, let me, give me, let's just grab it. And then if anyone has any questions, you can just put them in the chat and I, I was supposed to have this link prepared, but I'm just going to get it for you right now. And so there's helpful prompts in this guide as well to um, explore your elevator pitch further. Um, and I put the link, yes, yeah, so you'll see that um, in the in the guide as well. Priyanka, thanks for your question. I think I'm dealing with sales avoidance. Any tips to overcome that? Yes. So I would say one of it is practice, but it's also the framework. If you, you want to be clear about what it is that you're offering, how it's actually going to help. What I find is that a lot of heart-centered entrepreneurs, like in the sales process, forget that you're offering something so valuable and then they turn it around and then they think, oh, I'm just selling something. It's like, okay, let's slow it down. And it's like, okay, what am I offering? Why am I offering it? If this person can reverse their diabetes, why am I going to hold that from them? Okay, Priyanka, I don't know what you do, but I'm just saying, if, this, if you have a solution to help someone reverse diabetes, and you're saying, I want to avoid the conversation. Like, no, you're giving them an option to reverse diabetes and get off of medication. So for all of you, no matter what your, your business is, there's a service mission in your business and you want to get very aligned to it, remember it. And that in sales, or I don't even see it as sales, but a, a good salesperson is a good listener. 
and they are asked quality questions and they're actually trying to help the person improve their lives. So that means they're trying to help you find the best car for your family. They're trying to help you find the best dress for your wedding that you feel incredible about. So that's one piece. One piece is getting, getting, becoming aware and remembering that you're giving them an opportunity to feel better about themselves or have help in some area of their lives. The other piece is that when we when we know how to sell, so like in my programs, we have like a, a structure of format a format to follow that can help you have a smoother conversation. And with practice, it feels like you're sharing what you do. And so it can feel like we're selling, even if it's sometimes free. Sometimes people will be like, well, if I just take money out of the equation, then maybe it'll be easier. But we still have to um, make our free offers compelling as well. Dan says, you may have covered this. So thanks, Priyanka. I hope that helps. Dan says, you may have covered this before I arrived, but what's your strategy for figuring out the budget with the client? Do you insist on making them say a number first? Okay. So um, no. So like for me, because I, I, I work with coaches, healers, and guides, like I already have a price. And so I tell them um, what the investment is. But if you're approaching, um, it sounds, I don't know if you're approaching an organization, it's it's okay to ask them what their budget is. But I think it's always more empowering for you to know because depending on who you're talking to, they could lowball and say, this is our budget, right? And so it's good for you to, to say like, okay, this is how long this is actually gonna take me. And I imagine for everyone here that it probably takes you way longer than you imagine. And there's things you're doing in between that you didn't even quote to the person. So that's why it's always nice to have that little bit of extra cushion um, inside of your fee. So to answer your question, Dan, you can ask a company or organization what their budget is, but I think it's always good for you to, to, to look at the scope of work and you as the expert, let them know like this is what it's going to cost you know, given this time, but, you know, if that's not in their budget, maybe there's a little piece that you could break off and say you're willing to do for that. You're welcome, Priyanka. You're welcome, Ceci. Uh, any other questions? And I'm happy to hear um, what your biggest takeaway has been. Linda says, I love your overall definition of marketing. Um, thank you, Linda. And I think I, I have a post that says I hate marketing <laughs> because a lot of people say I hate marketing or like they feel uncomfortable with marketing. And I absolutely felt that way. Um, it's a lot as a solopreneur. We wear so many hats and then to be visible and to like you're the marketer, you're the salesperson, you're creating content and you're delivering the services. It's like very unique that there's so many hats that you're holding. And I think that one way to look at marketing is that you're sharing, you're sharing your magic, Linda. You're sharing what it is that you have to give. And we're not forcing, we can't force someone to give them our credit card. Like they have choice and we leave room for their no, that it's okay that, it, that it's a no. You know, there's something, I don't know who created the term consensual sales, but even just Another thing, Priyanka, that you can think about is asking, like, when we do a call, like, let the person know that you, you're you going to explore working together so it's not a surprise. You're not just getting on the call with them, asking them, and then at the end, you're like, yes, that'll be $10,000, right? And they're like, whoa, I wasn't expecting you to, to make me an offer. So the more upfront we can be, um, and ask permission, the, the better. Let me see. Priyanka says, any resources to practice pitching and selling? Um, yes. So I would say the guide would be a good start. And then I have um, a video on marketing Priyanka, I'm just thinking, okay. So I have a Facebook group and I have tons of video trainings um, that you can check out. 
So I will pop that in the link as well. You're so welcome, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Tim says, offer unique solution. Thank you. Yes, there's oftentimes people feel like there's so, the, the, the market's saturated. There's so many people doing what I do, which is true, but it's not just the service that you're offering that people want, especially if you're a service-based provider, it's you. So let's just take a doctor, for example. There could be tons of eye doctors to choose from but you're connected to this eye doctor because you like their bedside manner, or maybe you're connected to this person because you know, they're really smart and they explain everything to you as they do it. So part of who you are, there's a relationship aspect that people are attracted to as well. I always joke, you know, my dad's in his eighties and he's been going to the same copy place and same bank for like I'm 47. So over, you know, for us for 47 years, and he just has that loyalty to them and he wants them to have their business. And so just like business is a human interaction. So it's not just what you're selling, but your potential clients also care about their relationship with you. You're welcome. I'm going to just grab that. And so I'm noticing that we're at one o'clock. I will, how am I doing on time, Kirsty? Can I take one more question or? Yes, absolutely. Okay, let me just grab my, um, my Facebook link real quick. Thank you for your patience. Here we go. You're welcome, Priyanka. Um, the number one secret is my greatest challenge. Need to believe more in myself and move forward with confidence. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. My Riyad, I apologize if I'm saying your name wrong. And I would say that that's um, a challenge that most people that I talk to face. And it's absolutely something that can be worked on. I was terrified. You might not believe it now because I, I do do a lot of speaking, but I often share with my people that my first photo of Facebook on Facebook, and the only reason I got onto Facebook was because I was growing my business and a friend said, get on Facebook. It literally was a back, my back. I, and it was dark. <laughs> I see someone laughing. Jess is laughing. Like I'm, I'm not making that up. You know, usually when I have my VA here, I'll have them pop the picture so people can see that it was my back. And it took me some time to get comfortable being face forward. And, um, part of what you'll do in that guide is like looking at all the things that make you uniquely qualified. That includes your professional experience, your personal experience, your, your testimonies from previous clients, your love and passion for what you do. And I feel like the beautiful thing about that is that it can grow. Your belief in yourself, your confidence in yourself can grow. And so um, in the mindset piece that we were talking about, like having something concrete that you do when those, those, that monkey mind shows up and tells you that, I don't know if you're cut out for this. So I'm just looking at the chat here. I so appreciate you all showing up and taking the time to, yes. So someone asked about the slides. So when you get the guide, you'll see all the slides. Beautiful, I think that's it. You're so welcome, Rio. Take away universal, universality and language with clients. Yes, that's so important because you as the expert, and you've had so much training in different modalities, and sometimes it's easy to use jargon. And, you know, as a coach, there's a lot of jargon, you know, like holding space, you know, it's like, and, and I get what that means. Um, but you want to say it the way that your clients would say it. And then it's like, 
they're like, oh, we're speaking the same language. And then inside of your program, once they start working with you, you can introduce them to new language, new reframes and the way that you say it. So that's what I have for you. Um, it's been a pleasure to spend this time with you. Jess says she loves that I still move forward with setting up the page, even with the photo of my back. Yes, <laughs> it, it took some time, but now, and it is, you know, it's, it's a unique thing to, you know, we're the face of our business. And so now with social media, it can feel like a lot of pressure to, to perform and to, and to look a certain way. And what I will say is that paying attention to what you love and bringing that into your, bringing that into your marketing. So if you're a dog lover, so like I hired someone, not just because she had gray hair, but I thought it was cool that she had gray hair and um, she was she was going through her letting her hair go gray journey. And I appreciated that. So for some of you who are athletes or you do yoga or you love to travel or you love to cook, you know, showing those different sides of yourself, um, they create touch points and connections with your the people who are watching and listening. So that's, that's, a, that's a good sign, Jess, is that you get to be yourself and bring more of you. So like I see plants. So, you know, it's like there's so many people that are plant lovers and they will connect with you over that. Plus, you know, this is your expertise. So you get to be human and show more of yourself in your, in your content and in your marketing. You're welcome, Kelly. Awesome. I think that's it here, Steve. Oh, I would love to take a picture. I almost forgot. And it's okay if, you're, if your face is not on there, but if you'd like to, you're welcome to. And so as I do this, I'm just going to share with you, I, I'll count to three before I take the picture. One, two, and three. Awesome. So I wanna, if you host an event like this, right? Take a picture. And we can use that in your marketing. And I'm going to be like, hey, I, I spoke to a great group at the San Francisco Public Library. What that does is it creates social proof that I'm not just saying I'm a speaker. They're actually seeing me speak at places and I've got a picture to prove it. And so if anyone says something great about your products or services, say, hey, is it okay if I, if I put that on my website? Awesome. Thank you all. And thank you, Kirsty, for having me. Thank you so much, Khadija. That was really one of the best presentations I've, I've hosted, I've seen. Yay! And see, I'm going to say that in my marketing too, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to echo all the comments in the chat. Um, I think we all agree that it was wonderful and we're grateful for you sharing your process with us and um, just all the information you shared. It's all gold. And, and, and just FYI, I'm, I'm going to send the recording link to everyone afterwards uh, this afternoon. And so you can watch it again. Awesome. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. I look forward to staying connected. Thanks for joining. Take care. Thank you.